Uh, morning again. Uh, let's let's get get started. So uh, before I sort of jump back right to where we were, uh, you know, just to give a reminder of where we are in this plan. So we're talking about mergers here. So I'm going to pull you back to mergers a tiny bit after talking about collusion, and then I would also you know come back to collusion and or other types of regulation. Uh, uh, shortly, and we were sort of right about to finish this first module about merger analysis where the set of products are fixed, and we did some things. We talked a little bit about sort of related uh, uh, theory. We talked about merger simulation, which is this type of a structural approach that allows you to evaluate the impact of mergers that have not yet happened, or may maybe will never happen, just completely hypothetical mergers. And then we finished by uh, you know, visiting some empirical techniques for evaluating mergers that actually took place, a retrospective merger analysis, and that part was sort of much less, um, I say, th theoretically driven. These are very much empirical papers, and we were sort of close to finishing with this and then uh, moving on. And so bef before I do move on, there are actually, uh, there's, there's actually a nice point that came up in John's presentation that I wanted to connect with. So some of what we talked about was sort of the shifting landscape of regulation with respect to mergers over time in the US. And we mentioned that regulation with respect to mergers was sort of really strict in the 60s, in the 70s. And then there is some notion that maybe it is becoming uh, more uh, relaxed. It was kind of interesting to think about that when we saw the picture that shows that in the early 80s, a lot of the focus shifts to cartels. Uh, and so, you know, that probably, so there are several things happening. There is the Bork, you know, book and all that. And also some, some other things that have, have shifted things around. And that, that was a nice link between, between uh, several things we've been talking about. So let me sort of, uh, you know, finish with this part by, um, by talking about this uh, Blonigan and Pierce paper. We've, we kind of went through almost everything that's important. It's, it's just that there are a couple of interesting points that I wanted to, I didn't want to rush. So just to remind you, generally speaking, what do they do? So this is uh, where you don't rely on a case study of a specific merger, but you say, let us look at all mergers that happened in this case in the manufacturing sector. Uh, we are going to use some, actually also connecting with some of what John talked about, we are going to estimate some production functions from census data and back up productivity and markups and then use those as dependent variables in regressions that are trying to elicit the sort of treatment effect or the cause mergers on these, these outcomes. And we mentioned, you know, just a brief recap. You can put fixed effects in for several things, and that kind of helps to some extent maybe to deal with endogeneity, but not sort of in a, in a complete fashion. And so what you also want to do is to, const is to construct several control groups. So rather than just put every merge, every plant that was never acquired in the sample as controls, you start restricting the sample so that the control plants and the treatment plants would be as similar as possible. And, we, and there are um, several, several uh, um, strategies that the authors follow. Neither one of them is perfect, but it is kind of nice that they do things in different ways and they do seem to get uh, some recurring theme. And so these are the baseline results again like, you know, the big sort of title is that there are no productivity gains for mergers, so no rectangles, uh, okay, but there are some, some increases in, in markups, so you do have those, you know, triangles of dead weight loss. That, that's kind of the message, um, or at least that's how the paper was accepted uh, outside academia, I think, predominantly. But this is without any sort of adjustments to the control group, and then we mentioned, well, one way uh, to have a better control group, perhaps, is again to consider all the plants that were acquired but for each of them we are going to match some plant that is supposed to be as well as close or as similar to the plant that was acquired except that it wasn't uh, so ideally there was a flip of, of, of a coin that determined why this plant was a coin that one was not and so obviously we can never get to that level of, of, of cleanliness of identification propensity score matching really matches sort of pairs of plants according to the ex ante probability that they would be acquired. But that probability is computed based on observed characteristics. And so for this to work, you need to believe that plants that are super similar in observed characteristics are also super similar in un unobserved characteristics. 
except that, of course, the concern is that there are unobservables shifting everything here. That is the endogeneity concern. Nevertheless, uh, you know, you do get some support for the result uh, again, not with the nearest neighbor, uh, well, to some extent with the nearest neighbor, but if you have three near nearest neighbors, then you get an, an even stronger result. Uh, and then I think a couple of sort of more interesting uh, ways of generating uh, control groups. So now they say, okay, let's only consider the, the, this first analysis here. They say, let us only consider plants that ever get acquired. Okay, so we are already sort of looking at a sample that is a little bit more, um, you know, homogeneous in that sense. But we are going to differentiate between mergers that already happened and mergers that will happen sort of in, in the next period. And we are going to examine performance in that first period. So the thought experiment is that all these plants were supposed to be acquired, but by a flip of a coin, some of them got acquired later. Uh, you know, like maybe the attorneys spilled some coffee on the documents and they had to print them again and that caused some exogenous shift in the timing of the merger. And if that's really true, then the only difference between these plants is some, is this uh, random timing of the merger. We can look at the earlier period and then only the plants that already got acquired should be affected in terms of productivity and markup by the merger. And again, the, you know, the message is kind of similar, no productivity effect, but uh, an adverse effect on, on, uh, on consumers via higher uh, uh, markups. Um, you know, you can sort of see why this is not a perfect strategy. It could be that, that it's not random <laughs> why a certain plant was acquired today and another plant is acquired in the future. It could be that some of the benefits or some of the nice things that happen in that plant will only realize later. Or the other way around, maybe you actually acquire plants that are not doing so well. Either way, it could be that these things also shift over time and that would undermine this strategy. But again, it's another way of trying to, uh, you know, to use the data in this way. So yeah. the Sorry. Timing, because the, the productivity, I mean, if they're merging, there's probably a period of time when things are up in the air and they're shifting things around. Yeah. Right, so actually, so here they are constrained by the fact that it's census data, so you only have it for like 97, 2002, 2007, you have it every... five-year interval. Yes, these are five-year <laughs> intervals. That's probably better than I thought. So. Right, <laughs> so it's not so good for the exogeneity. Uh, yeah, I, you, you know, it, it, it would be more exogenous to say that one plant was acquired in January and the other one in February, but for actually capturing the effect, it's, it's better. Yeah. Right, so... It would be nice to see the time series, you know, how, yeah. how productivity goes over. Yeah, I agree. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you, no, you had I a point? A question, okay. I mean, sure. independently of the control, how much time are you allowing for uh, to see an increase in productivity? If you say it's five years, it seems like. So yes, it's, it's yes. So, so during five years, the increase was the one you're reporting to us. That, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering which, what are the controls, and in particular, the acquisition price? Do they observe it and how it uh, interacts with the other uh, parameters? Um, they, they do observe. They have very detailed data. I didn't get so much into, you know, I'm serving like a list of papers. I'm not getting into all the details of each. Uh, they had very detailed data on acquisitions. That was like a separate database from the census one. And so they knew that. But uh, there is no mention in the paper that they use the acquisition price. So, um, you know, what are the characteristics? It's more about... Uh, you know, basically fixed effects, um, uh, time sector fixed effects, or, you know, things like that. You don't, you don't really have much in the way of uh, controlling for other things. Right. So, uh, so yeah, sure. Uh, I will repeat. So the question was, why do they look only at the effect on the acquired plant? Uh, especially given that maybe you only acquire this plant because it's actually not doing very well and you're going to shift or uh, reallocate production from that plant to a more efficient one. So they're going to talk about some of these caveats. They acquired or somebody announced that they were going to acquire them, etc. That's not the important part. The, the interesting part here is this panel C where they basically differentiate between, um, between the effect of the acquisition of a plant in general and the acquisition 
by another firm that is within the same industry, so to speak, two digit or four digit. So basically this is like an overall effect of the mergers on productivities and market obtains the acquired firm and the acquired firm are sort of in the same market, so to speak. And you know, what is a market obviously is, is, is a big question. It's kind of difficult to capture it in this statistical analysis by just saying that both of these firms operate in the same two digit uh, SIC code, but, that, but that's what they do. Yeah. I forgive, this is an unfair question, but can you recall the economic magnitude implied by the coefficient on the markup? Are we talking about a 5% markup or? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it's more confusing. So this builds on that literature that, um, that estimates markups following the methods by the locker and co authors. And so markup here is really price over marginal cost. And so actually, <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the coefficients, actually you get quite, uh, quite, uh, quite high numbers here. Um, so the effect might be the, the sort of raw mark markups in the data are already quite high. But that is also explained by the fact that the cost is only the manufacturing cost. And I think the price sometimes is the consumer price. That part I wasn't actually sort of sup super clear on, but these markups to begin with are large. And uh, what, what is large in this setting? Um, again, so unless I got it wrong, it seemed like 300%, 400%. But again, it's, it's really just, I think, the comparing across because they are missing some parts of, of the cost. Like if there are marginal costs associated with marketing, distribution, all these type of stuff, then, then it's not here. So I think that's why these numbers are a little bit confusing and it's... Sorry? That doesn't have sale of goods in administration. No, no, it doesn't. We'll come back to that in the last slide when we talk about sort of what's, what's yeah, not here. That's an empirical question. Yeah. Are the places where markup is high, places where there's high fix and some cost, like drugs and stuff like that? Um, Just, yeah. That would tell us that maybe this is all makes some sense. Uh, right. I'll, uh, my best recollection of the descriptive tables was that I don't think they did it by industry, so, so I cannot, so I cannot yeah, okay, tell, tell, tell you the answer. The question was, you know, whether when you look at the raw markups from the data before they start using them as dependent variables in, in regressions, do they kind of make sense in terms of how they are allocated across markets? You know, are they high, they should be high? I don't know, <laughs> okay. Yes. We expect a lot of the efficiency gains to be above the flat level. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So let me hold, you know, the very last slide will be all about that. And they will talk about that to, to some extent. So let me, let me get, get back to that issue. All right, the point here is that, okay, now with this, and now, now we see that, okay, the effect of mergers where the two parties are actually not competitors. So he, here you can think about these numbers as the effects of sort of non-horizontal mergers necessarily. These firms are not competing. They're not operating in the same to digit industry. And then, uh, you know, the world starts to make sense again. And, you know, there is a productivity gain and there is no adverse effect on markups. Okay, so these are the good mergers. These are mergers between firms that are not competitors. The goal of the merger is not to restrict competition. What you would expect to see, and this is what we have, right? Sort of like Ariel is asking them to show you know, how markups are, are uh, you know, behave across different industries and so. But then, you know, if I think about, okay, so what do I learn from this at the end? So, you know, one cynical way to, to look at this would be to say that, okay, so what you tell me is that mergers are, are, are good except when they are bad. And they are bad when they restrict competition, which is where we started with. And, uh, and also when I think about that sort of very strong criticism by Bork, who made a very strong position that only mergers to monopoly or that create a dominant firm are bad, uh, you know, even that claim could potentially be, be consistent with this because I don't know within this set of, of mergers, maybe there is just a small set of really, really terrible mergers like the one we saw in, this, in the Swedish case and they drive up all the effects. So I think to me, this goes back to the question of, you know, trade-offs in evaluating mergers empirically. Here we have a setup where you consider many mergers together Whereas we started with papers that look at one merger each, each time. 
sort of really paying attention to the institutional features, etc. And when you start lumping a lot many mergers together, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, you get more generality, perhaps. There is less of a concern for external validity. But at the same time, you know, can I really pinpoint and see where the problems are? And so I think that, again, you know, I'm going to leave that as, as an open question. My entire sort of recap of this would be to say that people are using all sorts of ways to get at these questions. And I think that we can probably do more and maybe by combining some of the you know, notions of these different papers. So, so if, Mil if uh, uh, Aschenfelter, Husk, and, and Weinberg restricted attention only to mergers that were marginal, you know, imagine that you somehow combine that notion with what Blonigan and Pierce do. Or, you, know, you can think of all sorts of ways of combining the lessons from these papers so that we can learn more. But the bottom line message for me is that there is still much more to, to be learned and it's kind of a kind of an intractable problem to, to some extent. We uh, know that some industries are harder to enter than some others. Can we really control for that somehow? Um, the capital investment required to enter the industry. Yeah, so the question was, you know, is there some control here for uh, barriers to entry or to other sort of, you know, classic variables that, that we know should affect things? Um, the short answer is no, I think. Uh, but that would be another way of, right, of, uh, you know, trying to get uh, deeper into the data and trying to see where the effects really are. And then really to kind of finish, um, you know, then the last section they say, okay, well, maybe we missed a bunch of things. Okay, so the bottom line is that, you know, not a whole lot of, of evidence for productivity effects, although, you know, we just saw that as long as the, as the firms are not direct competitors, you do see them. Um, but are there sort of channels of efficiency gains that were simply not considered here? And so the quick answer is yes. Okay, so several of you have asked about it. What if the efficiency gain is not at the manufacturing level? Uh, what we back out here is the sort of productivity that is associated with manufacturing activities. And if there are other efficiencies, uh, for example, uh, it could be that the whole point of the merger is that we're actually not you know, one firm has a good product and another firm has a good distribution system. And maybe that's the synergy that they want. Now I can take that product and bring it to customers more efficiently. That's not going to be captured here. And a bunch of other things wouldn't. But the authors are aware, aware of this and they actually do quite a few things to try to rule out what they can rule out in terms of other stuff that were not covered.
incentives like cost and demand. And there are a couple of ways to think about it. So first, before you talk about mergers or collusion, sorry. Yes, I, I know. Yes, so it's true. If they would meet, okay, one thing that they could do is this thing that I, that I propose. Okay, so the question was, you know, if they really met together, maybe they just decide that one of them just sits it out and the other one produces the reality show. And I think that's true. I think I can fix the example in a way that makes that, that, that feature goes away because I agree it's kind of a problem for the example. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but I think if you, make, if you make the cost of making the uh, documentary or if you assume that there are 300,000 people that want to watch the documentary rather than 100,000, then they actually do want to produce it. And then, then I think that, that does away with that. So I, I was thinking about doing that, but I was, it was too late. And I was worried that I would screw up other things. So I left it like that. But you're right, OK? If they actually met together, they wouldn't do what, I, what the planner would do. They would do some, 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 something which actually would, would be worse, I think. Um, all right. Now, imagine, though, that we wanted, OK, there are several ways to think about how this applies to regulation. So we'll talk about mergers in a second, OK? But more broadly, you know, if you take this very seriously, you might say, well, maybe regulators should step in and start deciding which products, you know, firms should make. Because we have just seen some examples where the planner can get it right, whereas the free entry equilibrium gets it wrong. Um, I would argue that that will be a very, 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 uh, you know, you know liberal <laughs> uh, conclusion. I, I, I don't think that that is the, the, the likely conclusion. Why? Because in order to sort of efficiently intervene here, notice how many things this planner had to know. Okay, the planner really had to have a very good idea about cost and demand conditions, which you know, probably you know, firms might, may, may have a better idea about cost and demand conditions than regulators, and these things might shift over time. So I would say that you know, in terms of actually intervening to fix inefficient product selections, I would argue that you, know, you might want to do that only if you only if it becomes very clear that something is getting very wrong and you're willing to make a lot of mistakes to maybe make it somewhat better. But definitely not as a prescription that says, you know, let's just go out there and start estimating cost and demand and try to, you know, re-engineer all markets to decide which products should, should, should be sold on these markets. I think on the same point, uh, if uh, making a documentary would be uh, profitable, then a third competitor would enter and do it in addition to the two reality shows. Okay, so yeah, so I think that part of what this literature tells us is that, you know, if you think in perfect competition terms, then sure, if there is some positive social benefit from entry in excess of the cost of entry, then it will happen. That happens in perfect competition. Yeah. The message of these theory papers is that once you go to oligopoly, once you go to market power, this is not guaranteed. Okay, I think that that's the sort of ba basic point here. In, in perfect competition, everything works very nicely. All right, so we did, you know, so some papers that actually take this seriously in media markets, uh, Barry and Walt Fogel 99, and then some follow-up that I was involved in. So this looks at local radio markets, and the concern there that was expressed already back in the 50s was that there is excessive, dupli excessive entry into local radio markets, that there are just too many radio stations, and they produce very similar content while duplicating fixed costs. And, uh, and the question was, can you sort of validate that empirically? Can you think about such a two-stage game? Can you estimate and come up with, with the, so the original paper uh, only allowed for symmetric differentiation across stations? To a first approximation, stations were homogeneous. They were only allowed to offer sort of unique benefits through some idiosyncratic terms. And in that paper, it was indeed determined that there are way too many radio stations relative to what a social planner would like. I mean, there are, you know, with all sorts of caveats on that, okay? You need to go to the paper to see the caveats. Uh, and then this extension allowed firms not just to make a binary entry choice, but also to locate themselves in sort of horizontal and vertical cells. So now you choose not only whether to be in this market or not, but you choose whether to broadcast 
uh, rock music or country music or um, you know news talk content and you also choose the quality level you also differentiate yourself yourself vertically so you can choose to be a high quality country music station okay I'm going to leave it at that okay the model <laughs> the model allows for it okay um, and then again okay so you do that and you go through the motions and the econometrics become more difficult because now films are not homogeneous anymore you don't have that one-to-one -one. you don't have this if and only if that we just proved so uh, you need to work with inequalities so uh, there are some moment inequalities in there but the message remains the same <laughs> you know way too many radio stations okay and also some evidence for over provision of quality so the planner wants to kill stations and the ones that, that are there, you know, can, can actually broadcast at a lower quality level and everything will be fine. Um, then we can shift into some other, okay, so that's about sort of, you know, does the market get it right or wrong, etc. That's one part. And, and indeed, there is a lot of regulation of media markets and specifically of content. But the discussion of regulation of content, you know, this is especially true here in this country. You know, the regulator really gets involved in, you know, there are actually rules on how many reality TV shows you can broadcast. In, in, your, in your license, it says that you are required to provide such and such hours of original programming, of documentaries. It's very ineffective. The chains end up producing reality TV shows and calling them, you know, doc documentaries, <laughs> okay? But there is some sense in which, so, so the, the regulator wants to do that, but when you see the documents in which the regulators talk about it, they always say, yeah, you need, we need more variety because it's good. They never say we need more variety because the free entry equilibrium could be getting it wrong, which is not surprising, <laughs> okay, that they haven't read those papers. That's fine. Um, okay. Now, moving on to other types of regulation, what about mergers? Okay, so now we want to go back to our point. Okay, so now imagine that we want to do a merger simulation, but we want to allow product choices to adjust as well. And so a couple of papers to mention in that uh, respect that I know of. So the draganska mazio sign paper in the um, Quantitative Marketing and Economics. I'm going to talk about that one. Uh, and, and a more recent uh, paper by Fan and, and Young on, uh, cell phone, on uh, smartphones. Um, what about the impact of other changes to the sort of you know, competitive landscape. So there is my paper on what happens when there is upstream innovation. So when the inputs that you can put into your product become better, how does that affect the sort of vertical variety of the products that you decide to offer to consumers? How does the portfolio of options that you choose to offer to your consumers change? This is with respect to the personal computer market. So as the quality of the CPUs increases, as the frontier of what Intel offers you shifts outward, what kind of variety do you offer? Do you only offer sort of very high quality chips so that everybody has to upgrade and buy, um, you know, really expensive machines? Or do you offer more sort of mid-range or low-end uh, possibilities? And do you possibly get it wrong from a social perspective? Uh, how does innovation affect different types of consumers? These are the type of questions that come up in that paper. Um, you know, I may or may not uh, uh, talk about it depending on trade-offs with other stuff I want to talk about. Uh, and then there is a recent, this, this, this should be AER 2018, this is kind of new, um, government bailout. So here we look at the automobile industry, specifically at the, at, at the trucks. And we look at that very famous episode close to a decade ago when the government bailed out General Motors, right? General okay. Chrysler. And Chrysler, right, both of them, yeah. Um, and the question is, you know, we can actually write down a structural model and then use it to do the counterfactual. Well, what were to happen if GM and Chrysler were to go under? And the interesting comparison is this. In that structural model, when only prices are allowed to shift, then all you get is that a bunch of trucks are removed from the market and you know, output goes down, consumers get hurt quite badly, employment goes down, you, know, you produce fewer trucks and all that. So that seems like you know, a message in favor of the bailout if if you want to read it like that. But then when you allow within the model, when you allow firms to also adjust their product offerings, what happens is that the remaining players like Ford simply pick up the slack. Okay, now, okay, GM is no longer there. I'm going to make many, many more different types of trucks now. And that seems to sort of do away with many of these negative effects of the demise 
of the competitors. So the message is that, you know, even something like the bailout, which received huge, huge attention, and it's also, you know, a type of government regulation, if you like, or at least government intervention, you can get very different, you know, conclusions depending on whether you allow product assortment to change along with prices or not. Yes, all these papers are kind of about that. All right, so what I'll do in the remainder, I'll, I'll uh, sort of set up the stage for, uh, for some, some of these. What are some of the challenges that come up? I mentioned some of these. As you try to write down and estimate a structural model in which all of these things are endogenously determined. So first of all, there is this complex relationship between the nature of the sort of second stage competition and the number and identity of products that enter. So just to give a very sort of, you know, stark example, imagine that as we get to the second stage, we don't play Cournot, like in that example we saw. Imagine that you play Bertrand. So you, you, you kill each other, you price at marginal cost. So then vari variable profits become zero with constant marginal costs. And then, uh, you, and then if fixed costs are positive, you actually cannot support any equilibrium with more than one firm. So with, with very stiff competition in the second stage, actually leads to a monopolized market when you consider the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So the relationship here, the notion that I can somehow, you know, there is very useful information in this because if I can actually identify the conduct of that second stage competition, it would actually give me some clues about the entry game and about costs. So there is some information in this relationship, but it is a complex one and you need to somehow negotiate that within your model. Multiple equilibria, I already mentioned that, I already gave a little bit of intuition why that is a problem. Okay, now different conditions on primitives could result in different sets of products in the market. I cannot actually write down, so when I see that something happened, I don't know if it was the unique equilibrium outcome or was it one of, of several equilibria and that makes it difficult to write down likelihood contributions and also Related to another point that was mentioned here a couple of days ago, actually, when Mike talked about, uh, um, about some of the hospital papers, and he mentioned that there is some trade-off. Imagine that you estimate a model with these weak necessary conditions rather than with sufficient conditions. So on the estimation front, you're happy because you didn't impose very strong conditions. You feel like maybe what you do is more credible. But then you want to do counterfactuals, and your model is incomplete. Your model doesn't tell you, for instance, what equilibrium they select. And so how can you do counterfactual analysis when your model doesn't even pin down uniquely what happens? So talk about that a little bit. I think that that is one area, you know, all this literature is kind of, you know, not very old. And I think that this is one area where we really want to push. So for instance, in, 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 in my own paper, what I did was to actually enumerate all possible equilibria to rule out everything that I could based on the partially identified primitives and then I obtained this set of what I call potential equilibria in the counterfactual. So I didn't have a unique counterfactual prediction. I said in the counterfactual any number of these things could happen but that allowed me to bound what will happen in the counterfactual in terms of welfare. That's often quite difficult to do computationally. And then some other papers quite often pick some ad hoc way of selecting the equilibrium Sometimes it's really ad hoc, sometimes it's actually very well developed. But it's really, you know, one thing that we probably want to push forward when working on these, on these problems. And then finally, there are sample selection problems. This is perhaps an even worse problem for, for the estimation phase already. Okay? Because when we estimate demand, say following BOP, we almost don't think about it, but the first thing we assume is that we observe a random sample of products from an underlying distribution of product characteristics. But if my model now explicitly says that there was a first stage in which those products were selected by firms, it's making it a bit embarrassing to claim that it is a random sample of products. Firms have selected these products, and if they did that observing some random shocks that I didn't, then selection is on unobservables, and that could generate biases in the estimation of utility parameters that are very much akin to the type of selection bias problems that you see in the labor economics literature. You know, what, what happens when, if you don't work, I don't see your salary, that type of stuff. If a product was not introduced, I don't see what type of demand it would have garnered. And um, this is, but econometrically, this problem is worse 
because in the labor economics literature, you have all these independent units, all these individuals, and they don't play a game. <laughs> so each one of them responds to their own shock. But here it's a game. So my product selection choices may depend on my errors and on the errors of all the others in a very complicated fashion, and also in a, w in a manner that is not uniquely pinned down in equilibrium. So what do you do with all this? Okay. Yes. About this point, um, I have this thought that's maybe completely wrong, that if you do this, uh, you estimate the cross elasticities on uh, using uh, the BLP system with the characteristics, then if, if you have products in this, you create a grid of cross elasticities in which some products might be missing. So you could make, you could create a counterfactual. What happens if a product is introduced that has those characteristics? Okay, so that's, that's great, except that you can do that when you do that, when you think about that hypothetical product that was never introduced. Yeah. The one thing that is, that is problematic is that you don't know what the utility shock for that product would have been. You can, in that counterfactual, you can say, yes, what if I had this truck with this, you know, engine size and all that, but you don't know, you know, that psi in these models that tells you the valuation of unobserved characteristics like design or all that. You just don't know this product was never introduced. Maybe it would have been an ugly truck that nobody wants. Right. Okay, so, and, and it is the observables that drive the problem and not selection on observables. So that's fundamentally the issue. Uh, I don't really have much time left. I'm going to talk about, um, so I'm going to start a tiny bit setting up for the ice cream paper by Drag Draganska, Mazio and Syme. Um, okay, so the plan is to look at two such papers that have the following features. So this paper and my computer paper. Both of them have the features that there is a product portfolio problem. I need to choose a portfolio of products to offer to consumers from some feasible menu. Uh, we're going to specify a structural model for demand and marginal costs. That would allow us to estimate that second stage, so to speak, variable profit function I can come up with elasticities, markups. I can actually figure out how different first stage choices of which products to have in the market map into different variable profit outcomes in the second stage. And then I use these first stage inequalities, if you wish. Okay, in the computer paper, it will be inequalities. In the ice cream paper, it will be equalities. I will, I will explain why. But you would use that condition, that free entry condition that says that you know, whoever entered is happy and whoever didn't enter is also happy. You would use these conditions to estimate the fixed cost of introducing additional varieties. And so this is what you want. You want to know how consumers respond to varieties. Specifically, you want to estimate to what extent do consumers value variety. For this, you really want a random coefficient demand model because that allows you to evaluate heterogeneity in consumer preferences. You know, how many product variants does the firm or the planner wants to offer, that would crucially depend on the demand of consumers for variety, the extent to which they are different from one another. And of course, you want to learn about fixed costs because that will be both the private and the social cost of introducing additional variety. So you want to estimate all these things. That's the hard part or one, one of the difficult parts. All right, so a couple of papers. The main difference between these papers, so in the ice cream paper, uh, the firm chooses a set of horizontally differentiated product variants, different vanilla flavors of ice creams. And at the end, in, in we are going to have some merger analysis. They are going to simulate a hypothetical merger to figure out what happens to prices and to uh, product variety. And it's not just uh, you know, a hypothetical exercise. <coughs> the FTC actually ruled out a merger in that industry within a, a separate segment. So they're going to study the premium ice cream segment and the merger was blocked in the super premium ice cream <laughs> segment, okay? Uh, but the FTC in, rule in, in opposing the merger said prices will go up and consumer choice will be reduced. So the FTC explicitly said we think product variety will be diminished by the merger. So what these authors are trying to do is to figure out in simulation for a, for a hypothetical merger whether we see that because theoretically, we don't know. It could be that you actually get more variety after the merger. And it depends in very intricate ways on, on the primitives. You can see that, I mean, it relates to the basic questions about investment, 
R&D, you know, maybe when I have more market power, I can recoup investment, I might actually invest more, I might develop more products, I mean, who, who knows? Okay, it's, it's complicated. Uh, in terms of the econometric choice here, so how do you deal with, uh, sele with selection multiple equilibria? Here you assume that shocks to fixed costs are private information, so you're going to have this Bayesian Nash equilibrium, and that's going to be unique. In simple examples, uh, exactly unique. In more complicated examples, practically unique. That would en enable them to get over this multiple equilibria problems in estimating the model. And then finally, one last word. So this, okay, so this is for, for ice cream, for computers. Here I'm going to have the firm choosing from a vertically differentiated menu of potential products. I'm going to assume full information. So now everybody sees everybody's errors. So multiple equilibria will be part of of the game, I'm going to use necessary equilibrium conditions rather than sufficient ones to place bounds on fixed costs. And also I would address the selection issue also via another application of a partial identification uh, idea. So partial identification and bounds will come sort of in two different ways into this. Now I have like a half lecture on Sunday, so I think I will basically talk about this one, okay? But that's, that's what's coming up and uh, that's it for me.